Moving on, we're going to talk about pedostatic systems. So this is very common installation we see. This is our pedostatic head. So up front, we talked about this a little bit before. Pedo is going to measure ram pressure. Static is going to measure atmospheric pressure around the aircraft. So up front, we have the ram air hole where pedo pressure is going to come in. You'll notice we have two distinct passages here. We have a pedo tube riser right here, which allows ram air to come in through this main port through the pitot tube and into the pitot tube riser. The static tube is actually taken from a different spot. We have static holes on either side of the pitot tube, and this allows it to read non-ram pressure, basically the ambient air pressure around it. Now what you do see additionally here, we have a drain hole so that if any moisture collects, it can drain back out. One issue we have is that if moisture collects and it's very cold, then our ram air port here could freeze over or our static hole could freeze over and we'd lose our indication. So our pedo heater is going to be installed. We basically have a heating coil on either side that's electrically powered and we can heat up the pedo tube to be able to melt any ice on it. Additionally, if we did run into an issue with say a static system that was clogged, maybe a static port that's on the side of the fuselage, uh, we have what they call an alternate air source. So there'd typically be a handle inside the cockpit. We'll say something to the effect of pull to select alternate air, and it'll give us a alternate static pressure source to be able to read those. It's fairly important. Uh, one of the tests we conduct on the ground during like an annual, for instance, is to uh, not only ensure that we have a functional pedostatic system. There's a few tests that go through that we'll talk about in lab, but uh, that are required by the federal law. But also we will check that the pedo heater is indeed working as well. So the way that this looks on a system, we have our pedo head over here, which is powering our airspeed indicator. Remember that's measuring differential pressure between our static pressure and our pedo pressure. And then our pedo, or our static system rather, is going to be connected to our altimeter, vertical speed indicator, and airspeed indicator. The altimeter, remember, is gonna be an absolute pressure gauge, so static pressure is measured against that vacuum. Our vertical speed indicator is interesting because this is actually a rate of change instrument. So it tells us how quickly we're descending or climbing. Uh, additionally, you see down here that alternate static source valve right here. So if we have our ports on either side of the aircraft, if those become blocked, we can open up all our alternate static source. Uh, a lot of times it'll be just located behind the panel of the aircraft as an alternate source. As we get more complex, we have more systems that are hooked up. So this is going to be more common to what we would see with a large commercial aircraft or a jet transport aircraft. And basically the only thing that really changes is we have duplicity of, duplicity, is that the right word for this? We have a second set of instruments for the captain and the first officer. Uh, and we also have more instruments that are hooked up. So beyond just a airspeed indicator, as the aircraft gets faster and faster, we start using a Mach meter, which is gonna show the speed of the aircraft in a percentage of Mach. So Mach being a value of one, if we were saying we're traveling at 0.75 Mach, that'd be 75% of the speed of sound at that altitude. It's gonna be adjusted for density altitude and all that fun stuff, which is why it's hooked up to the static system. Additionally, when we look at a jet transport aircraft like this, you're going to have a separate source of static for the captain and the first officer, as well as an alternate static source. Basically, this allows both instruments to, both sets of instruments rather, to see if we have an agree or a disagree between either side. That redundancy is good to make sure that we can ensure the aircraft is operating properly within the constraints that it should. Taking a look at a couple different devices here, we've already looked at our airspeed indicator fundamentally. What you'll see here is a very basic uh, version of it where we have our static port connection, which again is just going to flood this entire chamber. And we have our pedo connection, which goes directly into the bellows and is going to cause it to expand and contract with reference to the amount of pressure we have from the static system that's filling the case of the instrument. That in turn is going to drive our sector and pinion and it'll give us our indication on the front of the instrument. Another thing we have is a true speed indicator. So this is kind of a little bit of a, a physics play here, right? As we change altitude, our density is going to change, which is going to change the reading that we would have potentially for airspeed. We also have temperature changes. If we are operating in a very hot or very cold environment, it can change the air density enough to throw off what our actual indicated airspeed is. So we have a window right here that allows us to change the 
uh, temperature that we're operating within, and we can use that as a calibration source to be able to read our actual true airspeed as opposed to what our standard airspeed would be under normal conditions. Additionally, we have a maximum allowable airspeed indicator. You aren't going to see this on small airplanes very much, but much more commonly on large aircraft. And basically that maximum speed is this red and white needle right here. That is the do not exceed speed or VNE. That is as fast as the airframe can go, no faster. Otherwise it's in danger of coming apart. So we can see that as a separate uh, component in some cases, depends on the installation and, and what it's being put in for. Here's an example of a Mach meter. So like I mentioned before, we have 1.0 is going to be the speed of sound. Right here, we are indicating Mach 0.83, which is going to be 83% the speed of sound. Again, this is when we're operating at higher altitudes, it's being uh, accounted for density altitude and everything, but uh, or pressure altitude. And this is how we generally set speeds for large jet transport aircraft on the long haul. Rather than reading in however many hundred knots, we go at a percentage of Mach. All right, as we pointed out before, this is just a rehash of the three-pointer altimeter we saw before. A couple things with altimeters. So we have just a regular dumb altimeter that reports directly to the pilot. We also have what they call an encoding uh, altimeter. And what that does is it reports to the transponder of the aircraft. That's a piece of equipment that communicates with the radar at whatever tower we happen to be in the vicinity of. And so with an encoding altimeter, it can actually give reported altitude information to the either tower controller or to the air traffic controller that's at a, a nearby station. Uh, it's more accurate. Uh, we can get a radar blip, but we may not be real accurate for the altitude of the aircraft specifically, especially for sequencing other aircraft around. We need to be very careful not to have them run into each other. And so knowing what level they're flying at is very important. So uh, in some airspaces, uh, especially in this area, as you know, we continue commercial service with Payne Field, more and more airspaces are requiring uh, mode C transponders and encoding altimeters to be able to help control traffic. But the parts we see on this one are pretty familiar. We have our indicator for ten, uh, tens of thousands of feet. We have our hundred feet indicator and we have our thousand feet indicator. So right now, if we look at this, we're indicating the aircraft is flying at, oh, let me think real hard about this, 1,100 feet is uh, effectively what we're taking a look at here. Uh, additionally, here's our Colesman window. So the Colesman window is going to tell us where we're at in terms of barometric pressure to have it adjusted properly. Uh, so we have another type. Again, you'll see this more commonly on jet transport. A lot of times incorporated with the glass cockpit. They call it a drum pointer type altimeter. So instead of what we see in our normal instance where the Colesman window is over here, we have hundreds and thousands of feet and we have uh, our thousand feet indication is being done on that window right there with the drum and pointer, hundreds of feet being indicated on the outside track. And then we have the adjustment not only in inches of mercury, but also in millibars to be able to set our altimeter uh, uh, calibration. Vertical speed indicator. So looking from the front, this just tells us rate of climb or rate of descent. So what this does is it measures change in pressure, not necessarily just pressure overall. As we take a look at uh, the inside section we have over here, uh, that's not the slide I was expecting. That's all right, we'll come back to that in a minute. My apologies, we'll come back to the uh, internals of this, but basically keep in mind that we're looking at rate of change. So it's not necessarily storing absolute pressure, it's not storing uh, uh, gauge pressure per se, we're looking at differential pressure and the rate that it's changing to get our indication on the vertical speed indicator. As we transition uh, into the next phase of this, uh, we talked a little bit about gyro equipments. We uh, have talked a little bit about a few different styles. We're going to talk about how we power instruments. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, gyroscopes can be powered either by electrical motors, right? So we have this fixed winding right over here that can drive the motor. We also have these grooves right here. They're cut to the outside of the rotor that allow it to be powered by an air system. An air system in an aircraft like this we call a vacuum system. And the reason being is that the pump we use is actually drawing a vacuum as opposed to pushing pressure 
from the pump out to the gyroscope. There's a reason for this, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. But looking at our most basic form, we have a external venturi that can be used to generate suction for the equipment that we have. So what we have are three gyro-driven instruments that would use a suction system to drive those gyros. So what we have is just a venturi right here and our small venturi throat right here, and it's gonna use basic physics. This is Bernoulli's principle. So as air flows through, we're going to increase velocity, decrease pressure. As a result, we have a filter that's gonna be located in the flight deck or in the cockpit behind the panel, and each one of those is gonna be filtered. And so as we draw suction out, it's gonna draw air in from the cabin through the instrument, and it's going to drive those gyros. So we have two components. We have this pressure reducing valve. So in this case, the turn and slip indicator may need more pressure to drive it than our attitude indicator and heading indicator. So we can use basically just a little needle valve to reduce the amount of flow that comes through. We also have a suction regulator. And what this does is it's a spring loaded device that if we draw too much suction, it's going to open up and allow air to come in further downstream as opposed to at the end. So we can limit the amount of suction that's acting on the gyroscope so we don't overspeed the gyroscopes. The next version we have is a pump that can be used. Now we have two styles of vacuum pump historically that have been used. We have wet pumps that are lubricated by engine oil. Typically you're gonna need something like an air oil separator to keep it from just spewing oil uh, overboard uh, because it's supposed to be a dry chamber up in this pump and it isn't really, it still spews some water out. And that's part of the reason why we use vacuum instead of pressure. When we do a vacuum system like this, Anything that comes in, right, this inlet side is actually where the instruments are, so we're drawing vacuum. We're still just moving air. This is just an air pump. And then any oil, anything like that can go out through the outlet and it gets combined, uh, or I should say it gets separated out in the air oil separator, and we only vent air overboard. But again, it makes more sense to draw air through that way as opposed to pushing it out to the instruments where it could potentially push harmful things down the road and cause damage to those instruments. The newer version we have is where the shaft and vane is all made out of carbon and is referred to as a dry vacuum pump. It's still going to produce vacuum. We aren't going to pressurize the instruments, but that dry vacuum pump is going to not need an air oil separator. The other thing that's kind of nice is with a dry pump like that, we can actually use the exhaust or the pressure coming out the outlet of that pump to drive things like pneumatic de-icing boots. So we can use it for a number of things. So talking about that wet system, here we have our instrument gauge over here. We have some familiar things, a central air filter, which is inside the cabin, drawing air in to power the instruments. We have our needle valve right here to restrict the amount of airflow, and we have our relief valve over here. The extra piece that we have is this air oil separator. So because the wet pump is going to uh, exhaust oil with the air, it has to be separated out so that we can drain oil back into the case and air overboard off the aircraft. This is a different version where we're using a dry pump. So in this case, we have two pumps on a twin engine aircraft over here. We have our filter inside the cabin, just like we're used to. We have our heading indicator and attitude indicator, so our gyro instruments. And in this case, we actually have a suction gauge, which is showing us how much vacuum is being produced in the system. We have this manifold check valve. Basically, it's going to shuttle one way or the other in the event of a failure. So if one pump fails, Rather than be in a situation where we're dumping all of our vacuum out through the dead side of the pump, it's going to shift over that check valve and make sure that we don't backflow. That way we can continue operating normally. And our vacuum regulator is going to be close to the pump so that we can change the amount. Whatever it is, it has to be downstream of the instruments for the vacuum regulator to actually work. All right, in this case, we are looking at a pressure system. So this is much less commonly used. It is used once in a while, but we have a air pump. So we have our inlet filter that's actually on the pump itself. So in this case, it's not a vacuum pump. It's actually an air pump because we're pushing air to the instruments. Same thing is going to happen. We have a pressure regulator to make sure that it doesn't overpressure. And then we have this additional filter that's installed to keep anything nasty from getting downstream to get into the gyros and potentially damage an instrument. But the concept is still the same. Again, you'll see a pressure gauge as opposed to a suction gauge. All right, let's talk about autopilot a little bit. So 
Automatic Pilot, we're going to have a few different systems that function on it, but ultimately it is used as a way to assist the pilot in active flight. And it's designed to help take some of the load off of the pilot so that we don't end up in situations where they're overstressed, overcomplicated, overdistracted, and they start missing things. It's not really designed to be a replacement for a pilot per se, it's just an assistment, uh, assisting system. So when we look at autopilot systems, we have a few different components that are going to be in action. We have the servos that are going to actually output anything to the controls to change the position of flight controls. We have the sensing elements that are going to determine what the aircraft is doing. We have the error checking components that are going to uh, check for any disagreements or anything like that. Those are kind of the primary points. There's a few more, but you can have a chance to take a look at that. We really aren't going to get too deep into this right now. Uh, what you're looking at is just a typical flight control system. We have a few different things. We have a heading holder over here. We have a nav holder, which is going to hold a specific heading or course. We have the approach, which is going to control different aspects of the aircraft on its way to approach. We have the reverse course, so we can input reverse and uh, take the reverse heading of what we have uh, laid in. We also have our glide slope and altitude hold over here. So again, we have a series of controls and different systems that can be enacted to do different jobs. In this case, we also have manual overrides. So we have our up and down pitch. So if we're changing, we, we can change our altitude hold, whatever it is, but this will allow us to change the pitch of the aircraft without using the controls, but by using the automatic flight system. We also have a left turn and right turn now that allows us to do that. This is kind of a generic one. Uh, they get a lot more complex than this. But the idea is a lot of larger aircraft systems that use an automatic pilot, if it senses a input on the flight controls, for instance, that'll automatically kick off the autopilot because it assumes that you're trying to override what the autopilot is doing. In order to not have that happen, if small adjustments need to be made, then the pilot has available to either use dials to change the altitude, to change the vertical speed hold, or just to straight up control the pitch or the turn uh, the bank angle of the aircraft through the automatic pilot so that it doesn't disconnect. Uh, as far as servos go, we have a couple different versions. Again, we aren't going to get too deep in these because we aren't really going to pull them apart much. It's more testing and making sure they function. So we have obvious methods. We have hydraulic functions that are using a balanced actuator, meaning it can go in both directions. So it's just going to act as a servo to move a control. And we have electric versions fundamentally. We also have a suction type of pneumatic servo, which again, we're getting into small aircraft autopilot systems, and these are gonna be a lot more specific per aircraft. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time diving into this uh, other than understand that we have different versions. If you're working on a small aircraft, you probably aren't gonna be seeing hydraulic servos like you see in a much larger aircraft. You probably won't even be seeing three phase AC motors because most small aircraft don't have three phase AC. You might see something with the DC motor. You might see something with the pneumatic servo, but it's really going to depend on the aircraft and what's equipped. It's not necessarily standard equipment for most small aircraft. And as we get into much larger aircraft, it gets exponentially much more complicated for how the, the automatic pilot system works. All right. So taking a look at a different instrument that we haven't talked about before, this is similar to an attitude indicator. But this is actually called a... Uh, flight director. And so the flight director does a few different things. It gives us an attitude indication as we're familiar with, but it also gives us a few different pieces. Up here we have our steering bars. So in the instance that we're setting, say, a course through the flight computer that we want to turn, these steering bars can show us what attitude we need to hold and what bank angle we need to hold. So basically these steering bars are telling us where we need to place this delta symbol to follow. Again, this is more of a flight thing, but that is how it's supposed to work so that you have an idea of what we're looking at. Additionally, this is the horizontal situation indicator. If you're listening, you notice me mention this earlier on when we were talking about the vertical card compass. You'll notice it looks very much like a vertical card compass, except for all the junk is thrown in the middle. And what this is, is our localizer system. So what you can see right here is the heading direction of the aircraft and we have this small little piece that represents the aircraft itself 
And then we have our course selection and our localizer function over here. They call it a lateral deviation bar in this, and it always referred to it as a localizer, as well as our glide slope, uh, glide slope pointer. So the way that this works is if I rotate my heading bug right here, it's going to move this heading marker, and it'll tell me which direction I need to fly. If I set that heading knob and then I punch my uh, heading hold button, it will hold me right on that bug. On the other hand, I have my course bug over here, which is going to rotate this entire localizer uh, indicator. And ideally, the way that this works is this would be set up if we were flying an intercept course to a runway. So right now, this de uh, the deviation on this localizer is telling us that we are to the left of the center line of the runway. There's radio equipment that's going to beam that back out. At this point in time, the glide slope would be telling us that we are on the glide slope, so we are at the right altitude for approach to the runway. The way that this works is the course knob would be set to the heading of the runway that we intend to land on. So in this case, we'd be landing on runway 30. Uh, as we're flying in towards runway 30 over here, we're going to see this localizer become active the closer we get to our center line. Once we get very, very close, in deflection, then the pilot would begin a left turn to intercept that localizer. And ideally, this will stay centered with our uh, uh, T over here. The localizer will stay centered as we're flying in towards the runway, and we will keep the glide slope on that center pip there on the glide slope angle. As we make that turn, so for instance, as we make that turn, this entire card is going to rotate. So as it's turned to a heading of 030, then we would see that up here at the front to indicate that's the direction that the aircraft is flying. So that's what we're looking at. Again, if you don't see this out in the wild, this is what it would look like if we have a glass cockpit installed. What you can see is a couple instruments we have that are incorporated. So you see down here, we have our attitude indicator, we have our, our altimeter and our airspeed indicator. On the glass panel over here, we have our airspeed indicator on this tape right here. We have our attitude indicator with our delta that you see in the middle right there. The entire system will function as that, which is why we have the blue and the brown for sky and ground, like you see on our attitude indicator. And we have the altimeter on this right-hand tape over here, as well as our compass right there down below. And again, that's typically going to be operating as a horizontal situation indicator, which is why you see this picture of the airplane with the localizer strip and the pips on either side. Additionally, we can see other things. We have incorporated engine instruments over on this panel, as well as different pages. It's not just weather radar over here or a navigation map. There's a number of different things that can be pulled up on that side of the panel. Couple points. So talking about things that happen inside the flight deck, we have a few different warnings. I'm not gonna make all the noises for you because that would be really, really weird. But uh, whether you're looking at your textbook or you're just pausing it on this video, take a little bit of time to look at the different warning signals that we have. There's a couple things that we have. The one that we already talked about is our uh, stall warning system. So smaller aircraft typically will have a continuous horn that sounds when a stall is detected. In larger aircraft, we may have a horn that sounds along with a stick shaker that actually vibrates the flight stick to simulate the feel of a buffet in the controls when the aircraft is starting to uh, uh, stall. Additionally, uh, these are warning systems we typically see with a larger jet transport aircraft, and we would see pop up with a enunciator system. Now, when we talk about the enunciator panel versus oral warnings, oral warnings are going to have some kind of audible component in addition to potentially a visual indication that something's wrong. We can get a master warning or a master caution light that pops up as well as an enunciator pa uh, panel that uh, lights up. Something that we uh, hear about commonly is a takeoff configuration alarm. Uh, this has come from accidents that have happened in the past where the flight crew has failed to get the aircraft configured for takeoff, the flaps weren't set, trim wasn't set, you name it, and it's connected to a switch in the power lever. So as the power lever is moved forward, if the aircraft is not in its takeoff configuration, then it's going to sound an alarm for the takeoff warning configuration. So there's a few different systems we see. Review the kinds of systems there are. We'll take a look at those in a little more detail on actual aircraft, but be aware that we have to have the components that sound or have a visual indication in order for it to fly legally. If we have a burned out light, but the horn still works, that's not cool.
both have to be functioning if both are a part of the system. Last little bit we'll talk about here are operating ranges. So each instrument you're going to see, whether it's airspeed, uh, engine instruments, different uh, flight instruments, they're going to have arcs, especially if it's a needle indicating. So we have a range for green, which is our normal operation, yellow, which is going to be caution, white, which is going to be special operations, and then red, which is prohibited. And then we have radial lines that indicate specific speed. So uh, we talked about that uh, red and white needle uh, for an ever exceed speed. We could also have something like a red radial line on an airspeed indicator to indicate our VNE. If we need that information, then a great source to go look at is the type certificate for the aircraft or for that engine. Typically, we'll find the required markings as well as normal operating ranges in the type certificate. So that's a good place to look first if you're having trouble getting that sorted out. Otherwise, we have the aircraft manufacturer uh, manuals to be able to look at as well. And last bit, uh, talking about those markings, I'm going to leave this up here. You can pause it here and take a little bit of time to study it or take a look at it in your textbook. This is going to give you the different kinds of markings we have for different kinds of instrument. I'm not going to make you listen to me explain every single one because we're going to talk about this out in the lab. But that's what I have for you. Hope you've enjoyed it. It's a lot to take in, but it's an interesting world. And we'll look forward to seeing you out in the lab to work through some of these.